For me to learn to play the guitar, uh, it was twofold. Seeing the Beatles on TV in 1960 something, 67, uh, on the Ed Sullivan Show, and the fact that my sister had a guitar and I didn't, and that made me very jealous. So I let my parents know the next birthday or Christmas, I wanted my own guitar, and it was kind of unusual back then. My first guitar was electric. Most kids get an acoustic for their first one, but especially back then, it was kind of odd. And I fell in love with it, took lessons ever since, and eventually went to Musicians Institute. That was my major butt kicking, and then started working after that. <laughs> uh, I think I have less than eight guitars. I don't have a big house and I don't like to change strings. I like to find one guitar that works and that's my workhorse. And it changes uh, every couple decades. <laughs> my last guitar I played for literally 20 years on a, all the Jeff Beck tours, the last Michael Jackson tour. It got stolen, it got beaten. I, I got it back. Once I got it back from being stolen, I decided to retire it. And then I got this new Washburn Parallax that I really love. It's the first 24 fret that I've ever had. And it's, it's like skinny dipping in a pool. You got all that extra room there. <laughs> there was about 100 people that auditioned for the Michael Jackson tour. And um, I was the lucky winner, man. It was, it was crazy. Uh, I was told, I, I, well, they, they told me what songs to learn, like a half a dozen songs. So I, I took time off of work, canceled all my students, and learned the songs. And when I went in, there was no band. It was just me by myself. And uh, the first thing I was asked to do is just play some funky rhythm, because that would be 99% of my job. So I improvised something. Then I started soloing. I played the Giant Steps tapping solo that I worked out that ended up on my first record. And I had already been playing the Beat It solo for several years in a cover band, so I thought he might find that useful, and I ended with that. And a couple days later, I got a call that he was interested, come down, play with the band, and see how it goes. And um, they never actually told me I was hired. It's just they never sent me home. <laughs> Eventually, I had a passport and a ticket to Tokyo, and I go, hmm, it's looking good. Meeting Michael was, uh, it, it's one of those snapshots that will be in your mind forever. Um, I remember the day he walked in, we had already been rehearsing for a month before he came in, and we had heard that if he was happy with what he was hearing, he'd start dancing, and he started dancing right away. And uh, anybody that didn't know him already was introduced to him, and I just remember the, the energy and the way he looked was just gorgeous, radiant. So that was a very special moment. I was on tour with Michael for 10 years. I did all of his solo tours without his brothers, um, Bad, Dangerous, and History. And um, the Super Bowl really stands out, you know, because I knew that was going out to 1.5 billion people. No pressure. <laughs> and it's the only time I ever felt that Michael was nervous, with good reason. Um, but I just had a ball. I thought it was really fun. Um, and there was, there was, there were certain places, like being in Rome, we, we had, we only played two or three days a week, so we had lots of time to see the cities we were at, which is really unusual for a touring band. But he had accumulated enough money, he didn't have to kick his own butt. Um, so being in Rome and seeing the Colosseum for the first time, things like that just blew my mind. But other than that, most of the shows were very similar. They were all stadiums, except for in America. It was, we did the winter time and they were um, uh, arenas. But it was, it was generally, I don't know, 50,000 people every night, just a sea of heads. We were in Sweden, they were all blonde heads. We went to Rome, they were all dark haired. <laughs> That's the only difference. <laughs> yeah, Battlezone, I came in at the 11th hour for that project. Uh, it's mostly songs written by Jim Peterick of Survivor. And Mark Scher, the singer, wanted me to come in and do some sessions. So I flew to Chicago, I did three or four songs. And a couple months later, they called me to come in and do more. And then after that session, Mark called me up and said, you know, it's, it's like your guitar is another voice on the record, so I want you to be a bigger part of it. And it became Cher Batten from there. 
<laughs> so uh, that was the easiest project I've ever done because I, I wasn't stressed about every single note. It's like, there's a session, boom, it's done. Let's go on the road. <sighs> you know, I, I don't have anything specific. Um, I'm always doing something. Doing recording, I do a lot of recordings. People send me a track from New Zealand or Australia, or um, let's see, the last one was from Austria, and I do the tracks at home and email them back. Um, I'm always jumping around the world, doing different projects, playing with different people. I went to Russia a, a month ago and played with a new band there. It's, it's always kind of nerve-wracking because you don't know the quality of the musicians, and you show up, and if they're good, it's like ah. <laughs> It's not always that way, but it's an adventure. I keep, keep touring, keep traveling, keep playing.